So welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Kim Ramsurian, who works for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Regional Office in Juneau, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, Kim's work is conducted throughout Southeast Alaska, which includes the traditional homelands and waters of the Aleutit, Iyak, Tlingit, Haida, and Simshin. We're honored to acknowledge that Kim is presenting from Juneau, Alaska, the ancestral land of the Tlingit, who have stewarded this, this area for thousands of years. The, the community thrives thanks to their continued sharing of vision, wisdom, values, and leadership. We'd like to also acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask them as we go. And my colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of, of questions for Kim behind the scene. She may also ask you guys questions and so I will read out your answers as you type them in. Kim will stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. Okay, I will hand it over to Kim now to introduce herself. Hi everybody, my name is Kim Ramsarian, and I'm so excited to talk to you today about losing the loop. How did entangled stellar sea lions lead to Alaska's first ocean guardian schools? But before I get started, I just wanted to talk about my journey of how I became a marine biologist. So I was lucky enough to grow up right next to the ocean in Southern California, and I spent a lot of time swimming in the ocean and scuba diving and then later surfing with my brother. I was also in the Girl Scouts from the time I was five years old up until I was in high school. So I did a lot of community service and I really enjoyed that. I love animals. We were one of those families that always took in stray dogs and cats. And I did a lot of camping, both with Girl Scouts and with my family. We, uh, we were always camping every month. And these are a couple of pictures of my dad and I, where we uh, got our shoes a little too close to the campfire while we were trying to dry them. And we actually cooked our shoes a little bit. And my mom and brother and I, this is our, my first time to Alaska. We did a one month camping trip when I was 10 years old. So how did I become a marine biologist? Well, I went to uh, my, got my undergraduate degree in wildlife management from Humboldt State University in Northern California. My first real wildlife job was working on a trout study throughout California for about five months with the California Department of Fish and Game. Then I worked with dusky footed wood rats. I worked on a couple of different songbird jobs. I worked with herring. I did a spotted owl banding a research job. And then I went to visit a friend of mine who was working on killer whales up in British Columbia or down in British Columbia, uh, wherever you may be. And I was hooked. I thought I, I love working with animals and uh, being near the ocean would be just the best thing. So for my master's degree, I went to Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which is in Central California. And I got my master's in marine science. And although I uh, did my master's work with harbor porpoise, um, because, because there were so many different uh, students working on different projects, we all got to uh, do a lot of different work with different species. So I worked with harbor seals and gray whales and California sea lions. I did some, some ship surveys and marine mammal surveys out in Monterey Bay. Then after I got out of school, I did a harbor porpoise survey on one of the big NOAA ships off the West Coast. I did some seabird research in Prince William Sound in Alaska. 
Then I worked out in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands for a couple of seasons on Hawaiian monk seals. And because I had banding experience from my previous jobs, I actually um, helped out a university professor and did a banding study of lace hand pinches while I was out there. So you never know what kind of experiences you get during your life, how they may come in handy later. Then I did some more um, surveys off the west coast of the United States um, on some big NOAA ships, some marine mammal surveys. And then finally, I started working with uh, stellar sea lions with the Department of Fish and Game in 1998. So what have been some of my absolute favorite career highlights? Well, I, I really enjoy doing what I can um, for conservation and protecting wildlife. I really also enjoy problem solving and trying to come up with solutions to problems. I've been so lucky to live in such amazing remote locations, especially out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here at Pearl and Hermes Reef way out here and ship surveys and working on helicopters and boats and um, from uh, the Aleutian Islands all the way down into Mexico. So that's been really awesome. And I've been lucky enough to work with amazing people, really dedicated people that are trying to do the same thing I'm doing. So I've been very lucky in my, in my work. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about a little bit about marine debris so we all, are, we all understand what we're, we're discussing as we go through this talk. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of our stellar sea lion research how we respond to entangled sea lions, then on to the NOAA Ocean Guardian School program, and lastly, some things we can all do to help uh, reduce the amount of entanglements that enter the marine environment. So Lisa, my first question is, what is marine debris? So for those of you in the audience, um, Kim's question is, what is marine debris? So if you want to type in what you think marine debris is into your, into your question box there, then I can read off any answers that, that you guys might have. And you guys might remember from one of our survey, one of our webinars back in January that we had Peter um, Murphy talking about marine debris. And so let's see. So Laura is saying that marine debris is plastic bottles and trash. Jasper from Juno is saying that it's stuff that is not supposed to be in the ocean, which I think is a really good definition there. And we've got other folks that are saying that it could be like plastic waste that doesn't break down. Um, I think that Peter had talked about microplastics, which are little tiny things, um, pieces of plastic. Michelle saying that it's um, trash plastic that makes it, its way into the ocean. And Texas is saying that, it, that it's man-made materials like plastic so that it, there has to be something um, that's not natural about the stuff that's, that's debris. Um, Ola is also saying trash, discarded fishing gear, non-biodegrading materials. Clary, is, Clary from Nome is saying plastic trash. And so um, what's your definition of marine debris, Kim? Wow, you guys are amazing. You are all correct. So yeah, it's, you know, everything you said, it's made by humans. It's long lasting, so it persists a long time in the environment. It's something that's disposed of or abandoned either on purpose or by accident in the marine environment or the Great Lakes. This is kind of a um, paraphrase definition from the um, from NOAA. But yeah, you're, you're all right. It's, it's basically trash that doesn't belong in the ocean. And I love that definition. So sadly, at least 693 marine species become entangled in or swallow marine debris. And this has increased by more than 50% since 1997. So this is bad news and we need to really do our best to help these animals. And now if you can see where my cursor is on this top right photo, we're starting to see a lot of masks from because of the pandemic that's happening. Um, people are letting these gap, get out into the environment and they're starting to entangle a lot of birds. So we need to think about that and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about stellar sea lions. But before I get too far into this, I am curious to know if you know the difference between a sea lion and a seal. And if you saw Katie Sweeney's presentation a few weeks ago on NOAA Live, you probably have the answer or you may already know. So what do you think? Okay, so for those of you who might remember uh, we talked about sea lions and seals in a previous webinar and some of the differences um, between them. So Kim has a picture here of um, 
of sea lions in in her um, picture here. And um, so Laura was saying that they have ears. So the sea lions have ears. Right. Um, and I, I think that there were some other folks who were talking about that they swim differently underwater. Yes. Um, and we're getting a couple of questions about, um, Ola is saying that true seals do not have ear flaps or rear walkable flippers. So Laura yeah. is also talking about their flippers. Um, Julia is saying that sea lions look like they have longer flippers. Texas is saying that a sea lion has external ears and walks on its flippers. A seal has no external ears and cannot walk. Texas goes to a, a lot of our webinars and he retains a lot of, of uh, information. So um, a, lot of, a lot of our viewers are pretty well versed on this. So um, can you help us out and tell us more details, Kim? Sure, wow, you guys are awesome, great. Those are all exactly correct answers. So yes, sea lions have these little ear flaps just like we do. And true seals or harbor seals just have the little hole for their ear. Just like you said, uh, uh, sea lions can rotate their hind flippers underneath their body so they can walk on land. Whereas seals uh, are more streamlined in the water so that on shore, they're like an inchworm. They kind of undulate on, the, on land. And sea lions have these longer front four flippers, whereas seals have short four flippers. And you're right about the way they swim. The sea lions use their four flippers to swim through the water, whereas harbor seals use their rear flippers. So they go back and forth with their rear flippers. Another thing is if you're out and you hear sea lions versus seals, usually seals are pretty quiet. Stellar, stellar sea lions kind of roar and California sea lions bark. So that's another difference that you can see. Okay, my next question for all of you is, where do you think stellar sea lions stay when they are not in the ocean? Do they go out sailing on their sailboat or in this case, sink their sailboat? <laughs> or do they, what do you, where do you think they go? So yeah, that's a very interesting um, picture that you have there. It does look like the sea lions are about to sink that boat. Yeah. So let's see, what do you guys think? Where do you think the stellar sea lions go when they're not in the ocean? Ola is saying that they come out onto the shore on rocks or docks. Um, Texas is saying maybe they're on ice flows or on land. Um, Julia is saying rookeries. We haven't heard that term here before, so maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. Michelle is saying land. So Kim, what do you think? Wow, you guys are really well versed on all of this. You're right. So rookeries I, I was going to talk about rookeries and haulouts in this talk so i wanted to make sure that we're all we all know what the difference is so a rookery is a place where the um, females here's a female comes ashore to give birth to her pup here's a little puppy and the males these big males come ashore to defend the territories so here in this top right picture you can see these three red circles, these are where three adult males are and these are their basically their territories. All these other larger like light colored animals are adult females and there are a few juveniles in there. And then these little guys are the pups. So that's kind of the structure of a rookery and these are areas where the pups are born in the summertime and the males defend these territories in the summertime. A haul out is used year round. So these are areas that are used for resting. So after the sea lions have been out in the water feeding, they come ashore to rest. So this or this uh, structure of a haul out is a little bit different. So you can see this is Benjamin Island here in Southeast Alaska. You can see lots of little guys, little juveniles that are like one or two years old, some adult females. So a little bit different looking. So rookeries and haul outs. So I want to stop here and ask if you have any questions before I continue on. So if you guys have any questions at all about this, the, the um, information that Kim had given us just now about stellar sea lions or anything about her, um, her, her career or how she's gotten to what she's doing, um, I actually had a question. You had talked about some of the favorite things that you um, have done during your work um, up till now, but do you have, um, do you know what the strangest thing that you've seen or worked on during your time is? Well, I don't know if this is the strangest, but when I lived out in Pearl and Hermes Reef, so it's just a, basically like a little sand flat, we live in tents 
And so you're just surrounded by animals, which is amazing. And I loved it. But I had a sea turtle that was trying to uh, nest underneath my tent. So that was a little bit different. And then a monk seal came up next to our sleeping tent during the night and, and slept next to our tent all night. And he was snoring all night long. So we didn't get much sleep, but we thought it was really <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. Um, it, you don't really think about seals snoring, but that, it, that would keep you up at night. Yeah. Um, we do have a question. <laughs> of what's the favorite, what's your favorite animal or, or bird that you've worked on? Oh my gosh, I, I don't know that I have one favorite. Um, I, I love monk seals and I love sea lions. So that it's probably a tie between those two. And then we had a question about rookeries and haul outs. So you had said that haul outs are all year round. Um, are rookeries only for, uh, do, do sea lions only gather on rookeries for a short period of time? How long are they uh, gathered on rookeries for? That's a great question. So normally um, the males will come onto the rookery in May and they'll set up their territory. And then the females will come ashore and give birth to their pups. So those males that are defending those territories may be there for you know, up to two months without without eating at all, just defending their territories where the females give birth, they stay with their pups for up to a couple of weeks, and then they go back and forth and feed. And then usually about August, that rookery structure kind of falls apart and the males need to leave to go get some food because they're hungry and the females and young may stay around a little bit longer. They may use it off and on during the year, but Usually it's, you know, the most of the animals are there in the summer and then they may use it just to haul out during other, other times of the year. Great. And then we had some questions from Ms. Hale's third grade class in Hawaii. Um, Noah, Zeeland, Zyla, and Leah were saying when you asked the question about rookeries, uh, where, where sea lions go when they're not in the ocean, they said they come on shore and go on icebergs, but does that happen? Do they? Do you have stellar sea lions going on the ice? Um, that's not really common. I mean, stellar sea lions are starting to move further north because of climate change, but um, they're not really, they're not an animal that usually uses ice too much. Harbor seals do, but, but usually not sea lions. Great. Thanks. Well, um, I know that you have a lot of a lot more information to go through, so maybe we can go into the next section and have everybody okay. hold their questions until then. Okay. So um, why is it important to study marine mammals? I think I'll just go ahead and answer this one. So marine mammals are an indicator species, which means they're, you know, they're kind of showing us what's going on out there. They're a lot easier to see than fish since fish are underwater. They range widely through the ocean ecosystem. So if something is wrong with the marine mammal population, there's likely something wrong with the whole ecosystem. So they're important to us to kind of let us know what's going on out there. And this is actually the case with stellar sea lions. So stellar sea lions, um, their population went way down between the 1970s and the 1990s. It declined by over 80%. And so the whole population was listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1990 as threatened. And then with more research um, that was conducted and looking at genetic differences between um, the sea lions, this, the population was split into an Eastern population here along the West Coast in Southeast Alaska and a Western population, which is kind of the rest of Alaska out into the, the Aleutian Islands. When that happened, this Eastern population remained threatened. The Western population was re reclassified as endangered because it was not doing well. Luckily, the Eastern population has now been doing great and it's been increasing and uh, it was taken off of the endangered species list in 2013. However, the Western population is still endangered and it's still declining in parts of Alaska, especially out here in the central and Western Aleutians. So it's really important for us to try to figure out why that's happening and what we can do to help. So one of the things we do, um, is go out and do stellar sea lion surveys during the summer months. And this work has been done with uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, primarily works in the Southeast Alaska region where NOAA works in the Western part of Alaska. So they kind of split up the duties. So what we do is we charter a big boat and we go to all the haul outs and rookeries throughout Southeast Alaska and 
We used to go to the Northern British Columbia also. And then we use these smaller boats to get um, closer to the rookeries and haul out so that we can conduct counts, uh, look for marked sea lions. We uh, take photographs. We look for females to see if they have pups. So we're trying to see how the population is doing overall. And then sometimes we get off on shore and um, observe from shore as well. And while we were out doing this work, we, we started noticing a lot of entangled animals. So this was kind of just in addition to the normal work that we were doing. And over the past 20 years, just during a two to three, sometimes four week survey, we have seen 830 individuals that have been entangled in marine debris or have swallowed fishing hooks. And this is just in Southeast Alaska. So we know it's a bigger problem. A lot of times it's really awful. We can't even tell what the material is that was entangling the sea lion because it's so tight in onto their neck. So I have a question for you. What types of materials do you think can entangle sea lions? And I threw a couple of hints on this slide. So for those of you in the audience, um, think back to what we talked about that was marine debris and think about what kinds of materials in that marine debris could entangle sea lions. Um, so Laura is saying plastic, and I can see that there are plastic things that you've put as hints in the water here um, that are like frisbees or um, plastic bands. Um, Jasper saying Jasper is saying rubber bands, rope, or fishing nets. Um, right. Laura is saying tires. So it looks like um, those things all have stuff in common in that they are. Um, things that are in circles. That's correct. So that's why the title of our talk is Lose the Loop, because loops are not a good thing for any, for any animal. So one of the most common entangling materials we find in Alaska, and actually in many parts of the world, are plastic packing bands. So these can be found, you probably have seen them on shipping boxes. When you go to the airport, they often will put a band around your box or your tote. Um, they can come on bait boxes. Um, here's on a on a to my son's toy when he was little. We found this big bundle of plastic packing bands floating in the water in Southeast Alaska. And you can see how awful they um, cut into the sea lion's neck. So these are bad news. Another are these black rubber bands. So these are found, these are used a lot on crab fisheries and other fisheries that use pots. But it's not just fisheries, they're also, here's an example from a um, pair of snowshoes that had a black rubber band around them. So they can come from land sources as well. And then like you, like you all said, nets and ropes, sometimes this may be when uh, fishing, fishermen are actually fishing, or a lot of times it's just that these are net, nets that were lost at sea and the sea lions get entangled in them. So I want to show you a few examples of some items like this. So I'm just going to click off here for a second. So I just want to show you some examples of these are things that we found on the beach. So here's a blue plastic packing band. You can see it's kind of unraveling, but it's still holding its shape. Here's another. This, this one I found just as it was about to go down a storm drain and out to the ocean. Here's one of the black rubber bands that's used on in the crab fishery. Here's a, one that, um, I don't know if you've seen these, fishermen often will put these around their um, wrists or their ankles to keep the water out when they're out working outside. So that's another one we've seen on sea lions. And then here's just some trawl netting that we found on the beach too. That's another thing that um, causes entanglement. So, so a lot of different. Yeah, we're we're actually getting like Michelle from Seattle, um, Cassius from Hawaii, and um, from Facebook, Tracy um, Taylor was saying they're they they were talking about jug rings, um, six pack plastic rings, um, soda loops. Are those things also? I know that they can probably entangle smaller animals. Um, are they also a concern for sea lions? Some of the small sea lions, for example, um, this uh, a group working in Namibia, out you know in, in Africa, they've been finding different kinds of um, pieces of buckets and, and other kinds of trash and clothing and things like that around the necks of of some of the fur seals down there. So that that's that can happen too. 
for stellar sea lions, they're a little bit too big to get the six pack rings. Those, um, you know, around this area, those are more something that entangles um, birds and that kind of thing. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So one of you said tires and yeah, so here's an example of a sea lion. Well, I don't know what was he thinking getting a tire around his neck, but luckily uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game was able to dart him and remove that tire so he was okay. Unfortunately, this adult female swam into a windsock. It pinned her flippers to her body and it caused her to drown. So garbage in the water is just bad news for all marine life. So now I want to show you a video. Um, just I want you to kind of just pay attention of the behaviors of the sea lions in this video. So here we go. So this is a rookery, and these are little pups on the rookery with their moms. And this guy is throwing around a piece of kelp. So this is really important to kind of pay attention to this guy, what he's doing. Here's some sea lions underwater and this one actually is entangled. You can see it right there on his neck, really playful. Unfortunately, this guy has one of those rubber bands around his neck. He's a little guy and look how it's already cutting in as he's growing bigger. And here's an adult male with a packing band. So my next question is, how do you think sea lions get entangled in marine debris? So when you think about the behaviors that you were seeing in the video that we just watched, where the sea lion was flipping the kelp up and down and the sea lion, the other sea lions were swimming underwater, how do you think that sea lions might get entangled in marine debris? What we're seeing is folks are saying um, maybe they are just playing with the loops. Um, Ola is saying maybe they're swimming through it and finding it on the shore. Um, it does look like this, the sea lions, especially the younger ones, are pretty playful. Um, yeah. Jasper was saying that they play with them or are curious about them and so they're investigating them. And Texas is always saying is also saying that they're curious. And so um, let's see. So oh and Kevin is saying that maybe they mistake it for food. Great answers, yeah. Um, Jasper in Texas, you're you're right on with the that they're playful. So if any of you have puppies or kittens or any young animals, you know how curious they are, and they like to investigate and figure out what new things are. And sea lions are exactly the same. So they see this loop floating at the surface, they go and play with it, just like that guy and just like that sea lion in the video. He was throwing that piece of kelp up and playing with it. Well, that's what they do with these loops. Unfortunately, it lands around their neck and they cannot, they don't have hands to take it off their neck. So once it's on, they can't swim backwards. So if it's, you know, once it's around their neck, it, it doesn't usually come off. And then they swim away with it. And then if they're young, which is usually when they're getting entangled, as they grow, it gets tighter and tighter around their neck. And then that's when it really causes problems. And then the other way that they can um, get injured with, in, tangling or swallowing fishing gear is when they interact with fisheries. So sometimes, you know, a sea lion may look kind of sick, but you don't see anything wrong with it. You don't see a neck entanglement. But here's an example of a sea lion that came into a marine mammal hospital in California and had all these hooks inside of it. So that can happen too. So I'm going to stop here and just ask if there's any questions before I move on. So if you have any questions for Kim about the <laughs> entanglement, Put, um, pictures that you saw or the behavior of the sea lions, please put your questions into the question box. Um, we did get a question about why can't they back out of the the um, the rings once they're around their necks. You you had said they don't have hands, so of course they can't use those to get them off. But why couldn't they just back out of them? Yeah, they just you know they can. You probably saw them swimming underwater. They can do all these movements, but they can't swim backwards. So it just you know there's no way for it to come off because once it gets kind of a little bit under their fur of their neck, it it sort of hangs on there unless it's loose. You know, if it's really loose, it may come off, but otherwise it pretty much is stuck on there. Um, and then another question is, um, what is the most common um, thing? 
that you see? Is it is it those packing bands or are there things that are more common than others? Yes, yeah, so packing bands are more than more than half of what we see are plastic packing bands. And then those black rubber bands are the next thing that we see most commonly. You had mentioned that you saw masks around um, in the in the environment. Is that more close to shore or do you see those out where the sea lions are as well? Well, unfortunately, we haven't been out into the field since uh, the pandemic started, but you know, we're I'm seeing them in parking lots and on the sides of roads and that kind of stuff. So it's important to make sure they don't end up in the water. And then Michelle from Hawaii was asking, are the sea lions in Oregon the same as the ones in Alaska? Well, the so that eastern population, remember I showed you that map where there's kind of the eastern population that's from southeast Alaska all the way down to California. Yes, those are, and we have had some, we have seen some um, sea lions move back and forth between Oregon and Southeast Alaska. Great. Um, well, I know that you have some other things to go through, so maybe we'll move on and then see whether we have questions after the next section. Okay. So I probably, you're probably going, what is Kim showing me a car for? And if you saw Katie Sweeney's talk a few weeks ago, you'll know why. And I asked Katie if I could borrow this slide because it kind of worked perfectly with, with what I was talking about too. So this is a Fiat 500 and it weighs the same as an adult male stellar sea lion. So adult male stellar sea lions can get to be 2,400 pounds. So the next time you see one of these cars driving around, you can, that's about the size of an adult male sea lion. The females are about half the size of the adult males and then the juveniles are, are even smaller. So how can we safely capture and disentangle a sea lion the size of a car? And stellar sea lions are the largest sea lion species in the world. So that would be, that is actually a, a good question to ask. I see you have a, a picture of a lasso going through the, um, around the car. And I can't imagine that you would use a lasso around a sea lion, but, um, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys, what does do you viewers in the audience think? How can how can a, a sea lion that size be captured? Um, Laura is saying that maybe you use something to tranquilize it. Um, Great, and then Laura. we have and we have a couple of, of guesses about um, how you might use several people to handle a sea lion. Um, so we're curious, how can you safely capture and um, disentangle such a large animal? Thanks for asking. <laughs> so for many years, we actually did not have a safe way to capture these animals. So we had to go out into the field and do our research and collect that data of all those sea lions I just showed you with all those terrible neck entanglements and we had no way to help them and it was awful. Uh, luckily, Marty Helena, who is a veterinarian in British Columbia, came up with a new um, combination of drugs that you could sedate or you know make the, the sea lion kind of sleepy but if he went into the water he would still come up and breathe because in the past the only drug that was used to dart sea lions was called telazole and if the sea lion went into the water it would drown so now we actually have a method to safely capture some of these animals so what we do is um we when we're out doing our research you know we find a sea lion so here you can see this entangled sea lion here and this work is all done with the alaska department of fishing games so this is a big team effort this is my friend Lori jemison who kind of heads up this program so you you know we it there's a lot that goes into deciding if we're actually going to go through with with darting a sea lion which is what we're doing here to um sedate them so it has to be safe for us, it has to be safe for the animal, the weather conditions and the sea, the sea conditions have to be good because if the sea lion goes in the water, we need to be able to see him, there can't be a lot of kelp. So lots and lots of decisions before we go forward. But once we decide that it's safe for everybody, the, the next thing that we do is our veterinarian, Kate Savage, um, She, you're right, she will dart the sea lion. So, here you can see this yellow circle, the dart is right there kind of in his lower side. And Kate is so amazing at this. Um, she just does it just perfectly because 
the, the key is that we would like the animal to stay on shore because it's a lot easier to do our work than if he goes into the water. But um, if so, she just has to get it enough so that all the drug goes into the, the sea lion, but not that it's really sharp and kind of scares the sea lion and makes them go in the water. And you can see what an amazing job she did here. This guy over here is still sound asleep. He doesn't even know what's going on. So she did a great job. So the first thing we do is remove the entanglement. And you can see this is a, a plastic packing band. So you can see what kind, what it does to the neck. It's really awful. So while Kate monitors um, the animal, um, make sure he's doing well, the rest of us um, mark the animal. So we use a uh, hair dye to mark a number so that we, when we let him go, we can easily see him again. We put a plastic flipper tag on uh, one of his flippers so that that gives us more long-term recite uh, ability. So like next year, if we saw that sea lion, we know he's still alive. And then we also put satellite tags on the sea lion, which I'll show you here in a minute. So once we're done doing all of that, uh, Kate will give him a re reverse uh, sedative. So basically it wakes him up and then we let him go. So if he goes into the water, we can still do it. It's a little bit more uh, complicated, but if anybody has ever done a, a man overboard drill, it's basically the same thing where once the sea, once the sea lion goes into the water, all eyes are on the sea lion because when he first goes into the water, he's not sleepy yet. So he may swim kind of fast. So you want to, we have a couple boats, everybody's watching him and you want to kind of stay far enough away, but not too far. So it's kind of, you know, a delicate, you want to make sure you kind of keep an eye on him. And uh, once he gets pretty sleepy and he starts slowing down, then uh, we go up and we use this capture pole that we made to uh, put around his neck and just gently bring him alongside our boat. And then we can do some of the same things. So we can remove the entanglement. We can put a flipper tag on. But in this case, we can't really use the hair dye on his side because it doesn't really work well in water. But we use uh, some pink uh, or different colored paint stick and color in his head. And that will, um, that will help us identify him once we let him go. So I want to show you a quick couple quick things before we go on here. So my husband helped me make this little um, small capture pole just so I can show you. So here's our sea lion, he's in the water, he's got his entanglement on. So once he kind of slows down and we can get the boat close to him, we just put this pole over his neck and we bring him close to our boat and then we pull this line underneath. We can take this pole off and then we have them alongside our boat and we also use another tool like a, it's called a shepherd's crook and we can hold them up next to our boat and then we can do all the same things that we did with uh, the sea lion on on shore and i also just wanted to show you an example of you can just see kind of the size of this little satellite flipper tag that we use So we use both a head mount satellite tag. That's this one right here. And we call it a head mount because we put it on the head. And then the flipper tag that I just showed you. So that head mount satellite tags are awesome. They give us all kinds of great information. Um, they have more batteries. So it's a, it gives us um, dive depth and it gives us um, movement data. But the problem is that sea lions molt their fur in August or September, which just like your cat or dog, the fur kind of falls off. So these will fall off because they're just glued to the fur. So they fall off and then we don't, we don't have any more data. So these flipper tags are smaller, so they don't have as much battery life, but we can program them to just come on once every few days. And then that, they can last well over a year and tell us if the sea lion is still alive, where he is. So they've been really great for giving us more long-term information. And I just wanted to show you some differences here of the, uh, the way that different animals behave. So these, all these different colors are different individuals that had um, satellite tags on them. So this guy in pink went way up here to Kayak Island after we released him. This guy in red just kind of hung around um, gla the Glacier Bay area. This guy in green started, we captured him at White Sisters Rookery and he went all the way inside to Frederick Sound. 
the sky in yellow basically just stayed in inland waters. So they all do something a little differently. And when we have enough of that data all together, then we can get more information. So these are just some examples of some of the items we've removed from sea lions. So the, this top left is a packing band. And again, you can see how it, it frays, but it doesn't actually break off. So it just gets, you know, kind of thinner and thinner, but still causes a lot of damage. This is a belt, like a steel belt from a car or a boat that we found on the neck of a sea lion. Here's a close up of it. And then we also cut flashers or lures off of the mouths of sea lions. So are there any questions about that before we, we move actually, on? It, yes, I think we've gotten a lot of questions. Um, I think that people were quite impressed by um, your story of, of uh, disentangling sea lions, both on land and in the water. Um, Priya from Mrs. Hale's third grade class was asking, what if there's another sea lion when you dart it? How do you make sure that people stay safe when you go on land to disentangle a sea lion? That's a great question. Well, one of the most important things is that everybody on our team has had a lot of experience working around sea lions. So what we have to do is we in our boats, we come in and we, you know, basically like wave our arms and trying to just slowly move those sea lions a little bit away from us. And they will, you know, they they don't want to be around us. So we just kind of move them away and then they'll either go in the water or go further down the beach and they just watch us. So, you know, we're safe and, and they, you know, as long as we do it calmly, then they're okay too. And then Jenna was wondering, are the darts recovered so that they don't pollute after you dart the, the seals? That is a great question too. Yes, they are recovered. And when this procedure is used like in very populated areas down in California, they use a transmitter dart. So it actually, you know, it's pinging and they can listen for it and they can pick it up. So um, we don't use those because they're they're a little bit more, um, you have to kind of make a little cut to get them back out of the sea lion, but, um, but they work well in a place where you definitely do not want to accidentally have a dart floating around. Great, and then um, uh, Mrs. Hale was asking, how long does it take to capture an entangled sea lion? And then how long does it take to disentangle it? Great question. So it it's really variable. Some of the sea lions have fallen asleep like in four minutes, and some of them it's taken 25 minutes. The preparation is the big part of it, you know, just deciding if we're gonna go. And then if the, if the sea lion's on land and um, Kate is darting it from land, she has to stop kind of way behind it and be really careful that they don't smell, you know, have a scent or anything. So the whole procedure leading up to the actual darting can be a couple of hours. The darting part is quick. Um, and so, you know, by four minutes to 25 minutes until the, the sea lion's asleep. And then usually we only have, we're only working on the sea lion maybe for 15 minutes before we wake it up. Okay, and um, and actually um, Jasper from Juno was asking, what happens with the entanglements after you take them off? We keep those um, because we wanna keep a record of what is happening. So yeah, we hang on to all of that, all of that material. And then Eve, Jasper's mom, is asking, how well do the sea lions heal after the entanglements come off? And do you put anything on the injuries um, after you've taken out the entangled um, item? It depends on, so um, our group here in, in Alaska, we usually give um, an antibiotic to the sea lion. Different places that do um, disentanglement use different kinds of, you know, some of them use antibiotic on the actual wounds, some don't. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the first part of the question. Oh, um, she was asking how well do they heal after the entanglements are removed? Yes, it doesn't seem like this stellar sea lions heal all that well compared to um, some like gray seals. They seem to heal quicker and harbor seals seem to hit, heal quicker. So you still see a scar long after, um, after you take the entanglement off. I would imagine that swimming in the salt water that should probably clean the wound out some even after you've you've um, taken the entanglement off. Yeah, I think so too. And then we had a couple questions about the head tags. Texas okay. was wondering how you retrieve the head tags, and Kip was wondering when the head tag falls off, do they be, does that become marine debris? 
It does. So that is not a good thing. Um, but we, there are some kind of tags that you can use that pop off and you can retrieve them. But this particular type just falls off when the, the glue, you know, when the animal molts. So yes, it does become marine debris. So that's, that's not a good thing. We'll have to work on that, huh? <laughs> and then um, uh, Mrs. Hale was wondering, do you know what percentage of sea lions that you see are entangled? Um, and then what percentage of the entangled ones are you able to disentangle? We, we don't have a really great handle on the overall percentage of sea lions that are entangled. We did a paper about 10 years ago looking at that. But again, we're only looking at a short period of time during the whole year. So we don't really feel like we're getting the overall, you know, accurate number. Um, in that paper, I think it was, you know, only close to 2%, but we know that that's really low. As for the number that we're actually able to help, it's incredibly low. I mean, we've only just been able to um, disentangle 10 animals total over the last few summers. So um, that, um, that's a perfect question for what I'm going to talk about next. So <laughs> Great. Well, I know that you have a lot more to go through with Ocean Guardian, so I will let you go to the next section. Okay. So um thank you for this great uh <laughs> segue into this next part which is prevention we want to prevent this material from getting into the ocean in the first place so that we don't have to have animals out there suffering with entanglements and we don't have to try to go disentangle them we want to prevent the marine debris in the first place so one thing we did is this is before we were able to go disentangle stellar sea lines we formed this pinniped entanglement group so um, Kate and Lori, who, the, who were in those slides that I showed you, and Mike Williams and I formed this group in 2009. There were four of us. We now have 133 members in 17 countries, all dedicated to the safety and welfare of pinnipeds. And pinnipeds are seals or sea lions. So our mission is to reduce pinniped entanglements in marine debris and fishing gear through education, outreach, and rescue. So, how did we learn about the Ocean Guardian School program? We'll just do this one real quick. So A from school, B from friends, C from a 12 year old boy, or D from a sea lion. So just so that you guys know, the Ocean Guardian School program is a program that Kim's gonna talk a little bit more about and, um, and it's a NOAA sponsored program. Um, so what do you think in terms of how, how did Kim and, and her group find out about it? Um, so Kip was thinking that you found it out from a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> Texas is saying that he thought that you got it from a sea lion. Um, <laughs> Laura is also saying a sea lion. But I think a lot of people are saying um, either school or a 12-year-old boy. Um, Kevin is also saying a 12-year-old boy. So what is the answer here? Your aunt, you're right. A 12-year-old boy is who taught us about the Ocean Guardian School program. Good job. So because we're always trying to learn more about ways to reduce marine debris, um, we came across this documentary called Plastic is Forever. It was made by Dylan DeHaze. He was only 12 years old when he made this documentary. And that's where they interviewed um, kids from the Ocean Guardian School program. And we learned about this. And if you're interested in learning more about Dylan, he's got a lot of other uh, documentaries. You can go to Kids Can Save the Planet to learn more. So. Uh, we talked with Seabury Nakbar, who's the director of the program, and Naomi Pollock, who is the regional coordinator for um, our area. And our amazing boss, John Curlin, um, let us try to get this started in Alaska. And my uh, supervisor, Aliri, and I went out and talked to some schools. And Thunder Mountain High School and Saeed Gastineau Community School said, yes, they wanted to give it a try. We didn't have any funding to get started. Debbie Hart from the Southeast Alaska Fish Habitat Partnership um, jumped in and helped provide some, some funding for our school. So it's been a huge community effort. So what is it? Well, it was started about 10 years ago in California. It's managed by uh, NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And it's a commitment to the protection and conservation of local watersheds, the world's oceans, and special areas like national marine sanctuaries. So it provides an opportunity for students and teachers in the community to participate and promote best environmental practices and sustainable activities. So this is a way you all can help 
you know, with the whole marine debris issue and other issues that are affecting our, our, our Earth. So a proposed stewardship pro project connects to one of these five project pathways, and I'm going to go through each of these real quickly. The first is marine debris. So this is reducing uh, and properly disposing of waste with a focus on trying to reduce single-use plastics. So this may be installing one of these um, water bottle filling stations, using re reusable water bottles and mugs, using real silverware instead of plastic, bringing a reusable bag. The second are the six R's to reduce, reuse, recycle, rot, rethink, and refuse. And rot is composting. So this is reducing the waste that's going into landfills and storm drains in our watershed. Because just remember, there is no away. When you throw something away, it's just getting moved somewhere else. So if we can just reduce the overall amount of what we use, um, pack zero waste lunches, stop using single use as much, we can make a huge difference. The third is watershed restoration. So this is native, planting native plants and remo removing invasive species. The fourth is uh, having a school uh, habitat or garden. So having you know a garden at your school, using compost that you've um, composted at your school, collecting water in rain barrels, not using pesticides. The fifth is energy and ocean health. So just trying to reduce our overall carbon footprint. You know, just turning lights off when you leave a room, using solar panels if you can. So I'm going to show you some examples of some of the. Um, the pictures from the schools here at Thunder Mountain and Saeed Gastineau. So the first, at the beginning of the year, you just do a project introduction to your school. And the most important thing is you want to have measurable data because you want to know where you started and how much progress you've made through the year. So you can do this through many different ways. One way is a waste audit, which you can do at home too. So in our case, um, we collected the trash at the schools for a few, few days before the presentation. Then we got a big tarp, put it out on the stage and dumped all the trash in it and then sorted it um, within in five minutes. And we looked at you know, what was in the trash that could have been recycled, how much plastic was in the trash. But the big thing that really, really bothered the kids was that there was a lot of food thrown away and they could not stand that. So they actually did something about that. They changed their lunchroom practices and they started composting. So it, you know, just that itself made a huge difference. So in the first year, you do some type of internal outreach. So this could be just making posters to put around the, your school and putting maybe information in your newsletter. The second year is external outreach. So here's the kids from say Gastineau on the radio. Down here is um, all the uh, kids picking up trash in a community cleanup. And then the Thunder Mountain High School students um, sold bracelets made from marine debris. And then at the end of the year, the students put on their own presentation and see the say guest to know students here um, wrote their own song and, and gave the school all the information about what they accomplished during the year. So we have two uh, Ocean Guardian Schools in Alaska now, Thunder Mountain High School and Saeed Gastineau Community School, and Floyd Dryden Middle School and Montessori Borealis are working toward becoming Ocean Guardian Schools. And just for example, you'll see that everybody's trying to reduce single-use plastics, which is awesome. But just in a few months at Saeed Gastineau, they kept 28,000 plastic sporks from entering the landfill just by changing a little bit of equipment in their dishwashers, the community, um, donated real silverware, and they made a huge difference in just a few months. And the cool thing about this program is that students around the nation are involved in doing the same kind of projects that you're doing. And the program puts out this infographic every year, so you can see over 10,000 students in 56 schools and all of the positive impact they've had in many different ways. And we're getting a little low on time, so I'm gonna keep going here. So it's basically, it's really simple. It's a simple hands-on school or community-based project. Has to have a watershed or ocean connection, internal and external outreach, measurable data. Then your teachers or your parents fill out a final report survey at the end of the year. Again, very simple. And then you become an Ocean Guardian School. You get to have a cool banner that you put up at your school when you become an Ocean Guardian School. 
So since uh, we work on stellar sea lions and we got to help get this going, we uh, got a stellar sea lion for the first year in Alaska. Last year it was a humpback whale and we don't have one for this year quite yet. So how do you do this? You fill out an application in April, uh, April 1st is when that it's available. The applications are usually due May 1st and then the, the schools are notified in June. And then you get all kinds of outreach materials and guidance. So there's a lot of support there for, um, for the school and the teachers. So please never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. That's Margaret Mead that said that. So are there any questions about that? I know we're getting a little low on time. Yeah, I think maybe we should go through your last section and then we'll stop okay. for questions at the very end. Okay. So what can you do to prevent entanglements? I have a little video for you. Okay, here's our friend Sammy and he is going to lose the loop. So please cut every loop before you discard it in the garbage. Here's a little tab from a milk carton. Lose the loop so that doesn't end up around a bird's leg. And now the masks that we're seeing everywhere, please cut the loops before you discard them in the, the garbage and please make sure they don't get out into the environment because they're already starting to entangle a lot of different birds. So please remember to lose the loop. So you can do other things, get involved in coastal cleanups. Get out just on your own and make sure you wear gloves and go with an adult, but kick 10 each, have a clean beach. You can get exercise, you can be outdoors and you can really help your community by you know, cleaning it up and you're saving lives of animals because this garbage that gets out into the ocean is, is hurting them. It can be really fun. You can make a game out of it, see how much you can pick up in five minutes. Please educate others. From now on, please remember to lose the loop and stash the trash and refuse single use. And also, I just wanted to um, add that feeding um, wildlife and feeding marine mammals actually can lead to entanglements too. A lot of people don't think about this, but um, feeding, it, it's illegal for one, but uh, it causes all kinds of other problems. And I'm gonna show you a video about that, my last video. Sea lions can travel many miles to find food. But don't let them get it from you. Active feeding of sea lions leads to aggressive sea lions. Fed sea lions will follow your boat and steal your fish. It's illegal and can be expensive. For good reasons. Fed sea lions and their young can die prematurely. So keep Alaska's wild sea lions wild. Take the lead and do not feed. And now I just wanted to hopefully leave you with some inspiration and just let you know that um, one person can make a huge difference, a positive difference in this world. And this is one of my heroes. This is Afra Shah, and he and his 84-year-old neighbor started cleaning up Versova Beach in Mumbai every weekend. So here's a before picture. You can see all the garbage and plastic on the beach. In some areas, it was five feet thick. He started cleaning up the beach and then pretty soon more and more people joined him and they have now cleaned up more than 60 million pounds of garbage, most of it plastic waste. Now you can see the after picture here. And the coolest thing is that re turtles return to nest on this beach for the first time in 20 years. So not only did he start this movement of having the cleaning up the beach so everybody that lives there has this beautiful beach but now these turtles can come back and nest and have their young and 
and you know thrive as well. So please remember that we can all make a difference. And with that, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that's been involved in the Stellar Sea Lion Entanglement Response and Research and all everybody that's been involved in the Ocean Guardian School Program, especially our teachers at our schools and our uh, Naomi and Seabury and John Curlin and, and Elyria and Ali Schuler who helped with this program and Debbie Hart and just everybody that's been a part of this work. I want to say a huge thank you to them. I also want to thank you so much for your attention, all of your great answers, and thank you for remembering to lose the loop, stash the trash, and to keep sea lions and all marine life safe. Safe. Thank you so much. And if there's any time, we'll have a few more questions. Thank you. I think we are just about out of time, Kim, but thank you so much for all of the information that you gave here. And for those, those people who are asking on the webinar, we will have a link to the Ocean Guardian School Program on the NOAA Live Alaska web website. And um, a couple of folks also had problems seeing the last video. So I'll put a link to that video as well um, okay. about, about not feeding sea lions. So okay. thank you so much, Kim, for all of your information. And um, thanks to everybody on the line for come, tuning in to our webinar. Next week, we'll be talking about um, our ice seal surveys up farther a little bit north. So it'll be seals again. And I'm sure that some of the information that you've given us here will be transferred over to, to questions for them as well. So thank you very much, Kim. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your attention. It was really fun. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.